Welcome back. So far, we've explored how information is created, produced, and exchanged to drive the project forwards. In this lesson, we'll dive deeper into the key information production strategies that can help ensure information generation and coordination is actually more seamless and efficient on the project. We'll look at three key points. Firstly, breaking down information into manageable parts by using a clear federation strategy. Then we'll look at clash detection versus clash avoidance. So instead of finding thousands of issues, we'll look at a more streamlined workflow. And finally, we'll look at file naming conventions that make it easier to find what you're looking for. These are just some of the building blocks that help teams stay aligned and deliver high quality coordinated information. But, but there are many others. All right. Let's talk about why a federation strategy is such a critical part of any BIM project. At its core, it's like creating a well-organized puzzle where every piece of information fits perfectly to form the bigger picture. We will see how important this can be for use in clash avoidance a little later. The purpose of a federation strategy is to break down projects into manageable parts. This ensures that different task teams can produce information at the right level of information need for each project stage. And more importantly, it ensures stability and security of the models by splitting the models logically, for example, by discipline or the asset or by buildings, teams can work simultaneously while still keep everything organized and under control. Yep. This approach doesn't just make coordination easier, but it also streamlines the delivery of level of information need, or as some term it as LOIN. Whether it's architectural, structural or MEP models, everything will stay aligned. Now we understand why a federation strategy matters. Let's see how to implement it. Here are three key steps. Step one, establish a container breakdown structure. This means dividing your models logically into manageable parts. For example, you could split them by buildings, disciplines like architectural, structural, or MEP, or even sub-disciplines such as concrete and steel models. Step two, host discipline-specific models in the common data environment. This ensures that every model is kept in the right place with proper permissions and access control for each team. For instance, sensitive information can be isolated for security purposes. Yep, and step three is about setting up boundaries and quality checks for each. This means defining clear limits for each task team implementing clash detection processes and regularly reviewing federated models to ensure everything aligns seamlessly. Because if you're like me, you've probably spent hours working on a model only to feel frustrated during coordination meetings. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, very familiar. So sometimes you just completed the first round of clash detection and proudly present the results to the team just to find out there are 3,000 unresolved clashes. You assign the issues to your team and then they spend two weeks working tirelessly to resolve them. Then comes the second coordination meeting, but instead of progress, you will discover that there are now 3,210 clashes. This is a big challenge for most of the teams. Yep, it's exhausting, it's frustrating, and it doesn't solve the core problem. What if, instead of repeatedly chasing all of those issues and those clashes, what if we could focus on avoiding clashes altogether? Let's see how we can focus on tackling the root cause of the problem. For example, you are working on a hospital project and multiple teams are involved like the architects, structural engineers and MEP consultants. When everyone busy working in silos, focused on their own models, here is what happens. The structural team uploads their model at the same time as the MEP team, so no one realizes that the HVAC duct is running right through the beam until it's too late. It's only spotted later when clashes are reported. And why does this happen? Because teams are following a traditional phase-based approach. Everyone completes their work in big chunks, design first, then review later. So clashes are only detected at the end of the phase when it's too late and too expensive to fix efficiently. To make things worse, when they finally upload these large batches of work, the clash detection tool throws up thousands of clashes. It's overwhelming, time consuming and incredibly frustrating for the team. By the time they are halfway through resolving those 3000 clashes, another batch of unresolved issues appears. Yep, this is a vicious cycle, really, really, painful and time consuming. So what if instead of waiting to detect all those clashes, we could take a more of a clash avoidance approach, working collaboratively, sharing information continuously 
in smaller batches and in manageable pieces so that we can coordinate as we go. What is clash avoidance, I hear you ask? Clash avoidance involves using a proactive approach to avoid those clashes in the models before they occur. Now, how can you find something and avoid it before they occur? Well, rather than waiting with those large batches of models and putting them together and identifying clashes during that process, what if teams were able to collaborate and coordinate with models more frequently and earlier in that workflow. This approach is all about sharing smaller updates and sharing them more regularly by following agreed standards, continuously checking for possible conflicts, we're able to eliminate that large batch of clashes. One of the most important concepts of clash avoidance is understanding and following the system priority structure. In simple terms, this means first step Install priority elements first, like start with systems that are most critical and least flexible, like architectural and structural element at the base, and then follow the right order. Once the foundational systems are in place, work your way up in, in the priority, like plumbing and mechanical systems and so on, until you reach more flexible systems like electrical lines and branch lines. Then you coordinate across trades by following this structure different teams like architects structural engineers and neb designers can coordinate seamlessly without stepping on each other's work let's look at an example to understand who has priority when coordinating systems on the left side the cable tray was installed first forcing the pipes to reroute around it this increases the cost significantly because these welded pipes are more expensive and much less flexible to adjust. If you look at the right side, here the welded pipes were prioritized and installed first as they are more critical and more costly. The cable tray, which is more flexible and less expensive, was rerouted to run above the pipes. So the key takeaway here is that by following the system priority structure, installing the more critical and more expensive systems, in this example, the welded pipes first, then you achieve a better coordination and a significant cost savings. Yeah, a massive part of that is defining not just who from a structure or architecture or MEP has priority. It's actually parts and systems within each of those disciplines and prioritizing them so that they have a key structure to that, a system priority structure that people can follow and share models in that workflow to avoid the problems. So now that we understand how clash avoidance can resolve these clashes and improve efficiency, let's talk about how we can manage all of this information. That's where the common data environment workflow comes in. The CDE helps to organize, track, and manage project information through four key states. They are work in progress, shared, published, and archived. First, we have work in progress state. This is where teams are actively working on files, whether it's model, drawing, or any reports. The key here is that all work happens in a single location. So everyone knows where to find the latest files, no confusion, no duplication, and no wasted efforts. For example, imagine you are working on a model update. Instead of passing versions through endless emails, you save and collaborate directly in the common data environment so everyone stays on the same page exactly now once the work is ready it doesn't just move forward automatically it goes through an approval process that takes us to the shared state here team leads check review and approve files before sharing them with others other teams can view and use approved files for their own work but they can't edit them if changes are needed, the file goes back to the work in progress stage. Yep, then we move to the published state. This is where information is officially issued. For example, this could be the final models or reports that are ready for construction or important project milestones. At this point, the information is authorized and locked so that teams can know that they can rely on using that data for their own tasks. And finally, we have the archived state. This is like putting everything safely into a storage, maybe a project or a part of it which is complete. For example, the published models, drawings and documents are saved so they can be referred to in the future. For things like maintenance, operations or even future renovations, this ensures no information is lost and teams can rely on it for years to come. 
Let's see how Planoly helps us manage the information in these different states. Here in Docs, you can manage the status of these containers of requirements, whether it's work in progress, shared or published. You can quickly update the status of each of these as the task progresses. Moving to the scope, we can also define these containers of requirements for our tasks. And whether it's proposed or published or verified, those states are also contained on every single task to make the approval straightforward and efficient. And then when we look in verify here, you can see the status of a model is also in progress, shared or published. So we know what information is authorized and appropriate for use. Over in the Kanban board, we can also clearly track the status of each task. So whether you're proposing, publishing or verifying these tasks, you can quickly update the status of these so that everyone is aligned on their status. And finally, in File Manager, you can see the status of each document, whether it's reviewed, asking for a signature potentially, or if it's approved, or even if it's declined, you can see that status and streamline the way that information is managed and shared across all the projects. This streamlined approach ensures that all information is managed efficiently and accurately across the CDE workflow. All right, now let's look at one of another key elements that supports smooth collaboration. That is the file naming convention. Right, file naming convention. It might sound simple, it might seem overwhelming, but anyways, it plays a big role in effective information management. And here is why. So first of all, it provides unique identification. So each file is easily recognizable and avoids duplication. Also, it helps track revisions systematically, making sure you are always working on the latest version of the file. And it also enables quick filtering and locating of files within the common data environment. No more searching for hours to find the right document. Yep, and with Planoly, we make creating and managing file names and file naming standards incredibly easy because it's all to do with the metadata. First of all, you can customize all metadata on all of the columns to match your project needs. So in this example, adding levels for a new column so that you can assign it to every single one of the deliverables. And next, we would start to define the file naming standard and select the appropriate metadata and separator so that it would use that data to concatenate everything. So like the project ID, who created it, what the team is, the suitability code, the levels, the versions, all of those can be then concatenated into a file naming standard so that once you save these settings, all of the files in that project are all automatically updated so that when you download a file, it will be named appropriately. It's quick, it's simple and efficient, and it means that you can even follow multiple naming standards by all of the teams, but one project-based naming standard that combines seamlessly in the project. So there you have it. There are a few methods that we can manage information more seamlessly. So remember, don't plan late. Plan early. With Planoly. We'll see you in the next one.